Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Gina Turnage, and I am part of the Hypothesis team. It is great to see people still jumping in. We appreciate your time so much. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter from SUNY New Paltz. Uh, please welcome Rachel Rigolino, who will be leading this session titled No More Discussion Boards. Yahoo. Uh, Rachel, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much. And I appreciate that, Gina. And I will apologize to everyone. My, I, I don't have my computer glasses on, so I'm struggling a little bit, but I can see that we've got people from all over the place. Uh, so that's really great to see. And this presentation truly is about doing away with the traditional discussion board that we have in our LMSs. Um, you know, whether it is Blackboard or D2L, wherever you are with that. I've been teaching online uh, since 1999, back in the days of dial-up. So I was very much on board with discussion board for you know 25 years. And I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully um, just walk you through what I've been doing recently. Whoops, wrong screen. Sorry about that. Let me just stop the share. Um, where is my thing right here? All right, let's see if we can get this to come up. And here it is. All right. So no more discussion boards. Uh, this was a big move for me to say that I'm done with them. I kind of, I think I held on to discussion board as a crutch for a long time, even though when I began using social annotation, I was kind of like, oh, well, here's some a little bit of social annotation on the top, like sprinkles on an ice cream, um, but I'm going to keep my discussion board. I, I really wanted to hold on to that, believing somehow, I, I don't know, I was just a little reluctant um, to ditch the whole thing. So, yeah, so we all know what this discussion board looks like. It looks like this, right? You, you post, um, I, I tend to post uh, several questions and give students a chance to answer. Uh, I give them choices, you know, answer two of the five questions. And I had quite a robust, I still do a robust uh, rubric for discussion board. And frankly, I typically recycle, not all of them, of course, but you know, you're recycling at least 50%. Um, and at this point, when you know, with Gen AI, the students are pretty easy to find answers to these questions. So indeed, doing away with discussion board was very important to me. It became, I began to see much more um, liveliness in the area of the course where I had the social annotation. And it's not just uh, an old fogey like me saying, oh, I've been doing this for you know more than two decades. Um, you know, researchers are finding that the social annotation um, really works so well, in part because the online discussion boards, um, as these researchers are saying here, non-substantive uh, learner interaction, uh, the dreaded threaded, right? Um, kind of unsatisfying to, I think, both students um, and to faculty as well. Became kind of rote and um, not so much discussion really happening. So the courses that I've now, you know, uh, in integrated social annotation into uh, I have a 300 level English course in the American short story, uh, 200 level in American women writers. And then I had a course uh, that focused on Gen AI actually and writing. And that was at the 300 level. Um, so some terms, I'm just gonna throw this out here really quickly. I use a lot of OER material and also um, sources that are out there publicly. But I keep in mind that uh, a, a tool like Hypothesis can be used and is integrated, let's say, with JSTOR. But I'm using a lot of stuff out there in the public domain. I'm going to kind of quickly go through some of these definitions. So obviously, social annotation uh, is this kind of technology where you are putting digital notes on top of text and there is peer-to-peer -peer online discussion. Students can reply to one another. 
but they're they're really grounded. They're tied to um, the actual text. And I think, and we use that word anchored, anchored to the text itself. And they're not just out on a discussion board where, you know, there's the discussion board very much separated from the text. The text can be, you know, maybe in print, the text can be on another screen that the student is not actually looking at. Whereas obviously social annotation, you're right there in the text. Um, public domain, I just wanted to point this out, that public domain works, especially in my field in English, are very easy to, to come by. And um, I use a lot of stuff that's in the public domain. Um, OER materials, I've used textbooks in the past that are OER. So that's another thing that I do, especially at um, when, when I come to teaching writing. And you can take you know, a web page or a text that's been created out there um, and then put hypothesis, have hypothesis out there on top of it so that students can then annotate uh, textbooks, for example. Another thing that I do, I um, you've got the JSTOR ability to to work with JSTOR, but I even, you know, I take course, I take material that is accessible through my campus library. And I will take PDFs of that material. This is fair use, right? It's um, I, uh, and using it in my course. So I feel, feel that that's a, a, a case of using something, uh, an article, a scholarly journal article from my campus library because we're behind a paywall, right? We're using an LMS. And I think this works beautifully um, again, with social annotation. So even if a text is not in JSTOR, it's in another database somewhere, or maybe it is a chapter from an ebook that's in the library, I grab it, I put it up, and the students can, can use that text as well. So obviously, we can bring up website pages, videos as a new thing that I was very brave this winter in using some YouTube videos. And it was phenomenal to have the students um, annotate the transcript. And then we've got blog posts. I, I put a lot of them in there as well. This was in my AI course, my Gen AI course. There are a lot of bloggers out there like um, Ethan Mollick and Lance Eaton and other people that are writing about generative AI. So we looked at their material. Okay, so what does social, okay, so I used, obviously we're here talking about hypothesis. I have hypothesis built into my, um, my instance, I mean, to our campus instance of Brightspace. So it's really nicely integrated into um, our LMS and that works well. So what does it look like for those of you that um, maybe haven't used social annotation? You may be wondering what it looks like. And this is what it looks like. So I don't know, um, anyone in the chat want to guess what story this is? I'm just throwing it out there. Does anyone recognize this story? It's certainly in the public domain. It's Rip Van Winkle. So um, I don't know if that's, you know, everyone on the East Coast is a big, you know, Rip Van Winkle, Washington Irving. And our campus is located in the Hudson Valley, very close uh, to where Rip Van Winkle, uh, the story takes place. So it's one of the stories that I use. And you can see here, this is, for, I think, from the Gutenberg, um, repository, you know, of text. And this is what it looks like. And this is, you know, the student has has highlighted the text and then written something here. And students can then respond. And then the student uh, responded to this particular description. And then students can respond to one another. Um, so I ask students to post throughout the text. The other thing I do is to pose questions. So I will isolate something and I will pose a question to students and I'll do it throughout the text. And I'll ask students, hey, in this story, can you respond to two of my, you know, I might have six questions throughout the text, respond to two of them. I also ask students, 
to uh, spread out their annotations across the story so that all the annotations are not just bunched up on the first few pages. And then I also wanted to point out over here, you can see that students can, can respond um, with images. They can link out to websites. In this case, the student is looking, we were looking at the landscapes and this student made a really interesting observation about um, the Hudson Valley, um, Hudson Valley School of Artists uh, from the 19th century and brought in, a, I think it's a painting by Thomas Cole. And again, right into the text um, and making this association with something uh, that is visual. Here, someone brought in the the Disney version of the Legend of Sleepy Hollow that, you know, as they're reading, they thought, wait a minute, you know, this is great. And I think this person brought in as a response. Um, oh, no, it was this person put in this and said, oh, by the way, I remember watching this, this uh, Disney cartoon. And it is uh, a lot of fun to be able to put in video as well and i think students respond to that what else so here's an example of how you can annotate a youtube video so this this particular screenshot is taken from my course in gen ai and it's stephen fry uh reading a um, a letter from nick cave about uh gen ai and it's quite an impassioned plea. So I just wanted to show you how students then, um, the transcript is brought up here and then students comment on, you know, select what they highlight, what they wanna do and then comment on that. Oops, I didn't mean that to be there. So, oh, I know what I wanted to say. So tied into this, where do most of my texts come from? Uh, I just, again back to public domain i i just think that i'm so excited about social annotation in a literature course or a writing course but also within the context of oer because i think that these um this really goes together so well so these are some places where i i get my texts and again with publicly available texts like youtube one other aspect i know i'm running through this very quickly is that I also use my own text and then student produced text. So if I have, for example, um, some kind of exemplary uh, essay that a student has written, of course, with the student's permission from a previous section, I will bring that in. And then we'll go through and annotate student written work um, and look at that, especially if I'm using it as an example in the class. So that's a whole other thing. I know that some people use hypothesis, other social annotation tools for, for example, peer critique work as well. So um, before I go on, I wanted to know, are there any questions so far? Should I just check to see? So far, we've had a couple of questions in the Q&A that I answered, but uh, I just encouraged everyone to post uh, in the chat with any comments or feedback or in the Q&A. We're happy to hear what you have to say. Because we certainly, I think we certainly have time. I was, um, uh, we have a little bit of time here. One thing I would say about this in, in the context of uh, peer review, for example, I used to have students post their drafts in a discussion board, right? So you post your draft in the discussion board and I would say, well, post questions to your reader and then they write, so you can do it that way. But what's really neat about doing it um, in this context is that you are able to really, you know, go, oh, here's a comma splice. I mean, not that students are pointing out each other's comma splices, but maybe you would grab a piece of a paragraph and say, wow, this is really well said or something like that. You're again, grounding, anchoring, anchoring yourself in the text. Um, hey, Rachel, we've got a question yep. from Paula. She wants to know how many of the assi these assignments do you usually add per class? 
oh, well, in the literature course, my entire course is built on it. I mean, I have, you know, I think social annotation takes up 45 to 50% of the grade. But that makes sense for a lit course, right? Because we're reading short story. Um, and, uh, Joe has a question. Uh, is there anything you miss about discussion boards? And uh, do you have students introduce themselves via hypothesis? Oh, that's a great question. No, I haven't had them introduce themselves through hypothesis. I, I I teach a lot of the time I'm teaching this asynchronously, sometimes high flex, and I have them introduce themselves with little short videos. Um, I don't really miss discussion board, except for the fact that it can be a little, uh, students in this, okay, I'll back up. Students became so kind of disengaged with discussion board, it was kind of easy to grade in the, the last couple of semesters I used it. Um, it, it just was pro, it just wasn't very, and I'm finding now that students are much more engaged, okay, with the text, um, that I have a lot more to read now. So I think there are some grading strategies you can take with that, of course, and there are ways to open up a tool like Hypothesis and look, you know, sort by a student's name. Um, another thing I should point out is that I break students up into small groups. I break them up into groups of five to seven students. So if they really become engaged, um, you know, and they kind of get to know each other. I try to keep the groups, you know, uh, the same for maybe uh, three or four weeks at a time. So, and again, uh, go ahead. So we have another question um, about some strategies, which you may be getting to this. What strategies do you use to get the students to engage with other students' annotations so that you do get more of that sort of threaded discussion conversation feel? You know, um, that's a great, I, I do in my rubric, I say, please reply to five students, you know, or whatever it is in the rubric for that particular module. I find that you have to do that, but I'm also finding because, how do I say this? Yeah, because the, the annotation is staring them right in the face when they get into the document, uh, much more like people go well beyond the minimum now. Whereas with discussion board, it was like, oh, I've got to wade through this and think of something to say. Whereas, yeah, it's not really as much of an issue anymore because the moment they click on the document and that's the reading, they see what other other people have been saying. So and, uh, Julia asked if you're using the LMS app, which I'm assuming that you are. And uh, I think it goes to along with your question about groups. And I think um, Julia, I'm sure she's using the groups, groups functionality within her LMS. So she creates the groups first within the LMS. And then when she's grabbing that uh, file picker of the file type, she'll click on the little button that says this is a group assignment. And then she'll assign the groups to the reading that she wants on that. Is that correct, Rachel? That is correct. That sounds right. And, you know, sometimes I can't remember instructions. I, I have to remember it just by doing it. But that's that sounds exactly right on point. Um, and again, I'm just tying this to OER and public. And this would not work for everybody, obviously. Um, but for my students, uh, this is where, you know, um, it just works so well. I, I just wanted to say, if you if you Google discussion board, I mean, you get stuff like this. It, it, it's so funny if you go on Reddit even. I mean, it's just, I've found some really, really uh, kind of amusing responses to discussion boards. So just to sum up, um, there's this, this direct engagement with the text and it does become collaborative because if I'm signing on, I see that somebody did this and they highlighted this and I'm like, well, why? And then I'm reading what they say. Um, much more conversation. Um, the discussion is just so much more dynamic. Now I know that people can do, you know, do jerry rig discussion boards to create more of a dynamic situation. I'm not saying that that's impossible. Uh, it certainly is possible with different strategies. But to me, if you're able to use, um, just have that text up on the screen and then have the discussion, it just 
seems to be much more dynamic. And you, here, we got a question from Jeremy, if you could, wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, he says he uses graded discussions when he wants students to generate something for which it could be useful to see how other students are responding to the assignments. So students' assignment submissions are viewable by peers. They're not really discussions. Curious um, as to how or why one would move away from this. And since you did use discussion boards, perhaps you can sort of give them pros and cons. Oh, from the discussion. Well, this, you know, I with literature courses, right? So let's say I have a story like Rip Van Winkle, okay? And I would have what I felt were fantastic discussion questions because I often with my discussion questions embedded all kinds of video, I'll watch this and then respond to it. Here's a film version of Rip Van Winkle, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the problem was it was kind of, as I say, discrete from and separated from the text. Now, I'm not sure with that questioner, the questioner is saying that they put a particular text into discussion board. Is that what he's doing? Putting a PDF or? Jeremy, feel free to just uh, yeah, you can just... answer if you want. I mean, you can put in, I did have a class recently put, you know, put their drafts into discussion boards um, because I felt that that was going to work better for that particular assignment. And they were in small groups in discussion board and it just, you know, the drafts were like seven pages long. It was easier for them to upload their work there. Um, and that did work well. Okay, well, we'll, we'll just let you uh, okay. finish up. We got about seven minutes. So just, um, just to point out that there's more and more research about social annotation and the, the collaborative nature um, of it as opposed to uh, discussion board. I, I also want to say that, that using this, not just in an async class, but using it as a way to get students into the text before you have a, a class meeting also seems to work well. Um, I know people have spoken about that as well. People that are teaching, you know, primarily in-person classes or hybrid classes um, or flipping the classroom, having them do the annotations before you meet as a class and do, um, you know, in-person live, um, live, discussion. It works really well. So anyway, that's why I, I, yeah, I'm probably not going to be going back to discussion board anytime soon. Um, for the most part, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been sold on just totally social annotation. And as I say, the only, the only downside is the students are much more engaged and there's much more to kind of to sort through and read and look at. So as a result, but that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> better better to know what they're thinking than not know what they're thinking. Better to help them prepare for assignments or um, you know test papers. Oh, I did see a question I missed. Uh, could students use AI to post and a reply to their peers? This is a good yeah. question, uh, Giselle. We, we've had some workshops on this. Um, so go ahead, Rachel. Oh, no, no, oh. without a doubt. I mean, without a doubt. But now there's like an extra step. Is an extra two. By the time you're done with like the extra step or two, you know, um, probably you're just going to leave your annotation. You know, I mean, I guess someone who was totally disengaged and just didn't want to read anything, um, you do occasionally still see that. But, you know, in discussion board, it was even easier to just do that. Um, I think what I'll tell you right now, what made me give up actually on discussion board and throw in the towel was when I was getting quite answers to to my prompts that were not about the story. Uh, and I realized, where is this coming from? And then I realized it was something that was, you know, totally fabricated. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm done with this. I just so, can't get yeah. any more answers like that anymore. <laughs> the conversation is is sort of focused on the content itself. And that's where the discussion is. And I think, Giselle, one other thing I'll add is 
Um, we do have some sample AI assignments because uh, our success team does a great workshop on not really for or against it, but how and how to educate your students. And also what I'm hearing is if a student is posting an AI comment, the instructor can tell. Um, so that's a teachable moment to address that with your student and uh, that it's not hard to tell the difference in the re replies, but I do think it's something to think about and it is something to teach the students and educate them on how to use large learning models and how not to and, you know, what's true and what's hallucinating and things like that. So we are certainly ha happy to help you navigate through that, that piece of it. Yeah, we've got about three more minutes. So if anyone's got any last minute questions, we're happy to answer those before you move on to your next session. And if anyone wants to send me an email, um, certainly feel free to do so. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm on the East Coast in New York in the SUNY system at uh, SUNY New Pulse. Oh, do you want to post your slides in the chat? Do you feel comfortable with that, Rachel? I forgot to ask you that. Oh, okay. Well, you know, they're, they're on OneDrive. Can I send them to you later or? Yeah. All right. Do you want? Yeah, for sure. I know we had that question early on and I have forgotten to ask. So, well, we'll let you guys go. You get two minutes back and get ready for your next session. So thank you, Rachel, so much for your insight, for your time. And I so much appreciate all the interaction with uh, all you that uh, posted and asked questions. We appreciate you being involved and uh, have a good rest of the conference. Bye, everybody. Take care.